This is Do School Better, a podcast for people who want to transform education. My name is Doris Corda, and for the past several years, I've been training educators. Listen to these episodes and hear about some of the extraordinary programs they've created. We call these pioneers the fire starters. See if you can get some ideas that you can implement yourself to change your own practice. In this episode, Dora speaks with Pam Reed, humanities teacher at Columbus City Preparatory School for Girls. Pam shares how her teaching changed with this radically different method as students learned history and critical thinking by solving contemporary problems that they find meaningful. If you like this podcast, we invite you to share it with someone else who might enjoy it as well. So hello, Pam. Hi. So I'm so happy to be with you. And this is just after you finished your pilot, your first ever unit, can you please start by telling folks about yourself and then what brought you to the workshop? Yes. Uh, so my name is Pam Reed, and I've been teaching in Columbus City Schools for 20 years. I love everything about urban education. I started teaching at a middle school on the south side of Columbus, and was working with a mostly Appalachian and African American population. I went to a an elementary school for one year. I found out elementary is not for me at all. Uh, in that time, I got my master's degree in teacher leadership. Um, I have my national board certification in ELA, which I just renewed. And then I came here to Columbus City Preparatory School for Girls, uh, where my daughters both also attend. I have two girls, they're 13 and 11, who go here. Um, I teach eighth grade English, and then this year we are starting a pilot program of teaching an eighth grade humanities class, which I got to write and teach. That's so exciting. So you're teaching humanities and you're teaching English. Yes. And this is a, can you t- tell a little bit about the school? Yeah, so our school was started in 2010. The founder of the school uh, still works in Columbus City, and she visited different private girls' schools around the country to find to put together a model of what would work for us. We're one of the few urban middle schools for girls in the country. We basically take girls as a lottery system from all over the city and teach them. Like we have, uh, we have an advisory program here. We have morning salutes. We have a morning meeting every morning. Um, our girls get to have more enrichment, so they do. It's not like a traditional thing where there's intervention. Uh, We have clubs and tons of opportunities for shadowing in hospitals and businesses. It's a really different environment. And it's it's the only girls' public school in the city of Columbus, correct? It is, and we're one of the few in the state. I don't think there's another public girls' middle school in the state of Ohio. Really interesting. So you came to the workshop. Talk about what that did for you and what you came out deciding to do and what just happened? Like, tell us a little bit about that. Well, as a teacher, I've always been a risk taker. So if there was something that was um, new or innovative, I was always willing to try it. And coming to the workshop, I had no idea, to be honest with you, what to expect. Sure. So my principal kind of posed this entrepreneurial lab um, idea and... When she posed it, I actually wrote a grant to get kind of what I envisioned in my head. But the workshop was not what I had envisioned. Um, I thought it would be one of the prepackaged, like, here's what you do kind of deal. Here's the the packaged curriculum for an entrepreneurship class. And here's how we're all going to practice it the same way. And we're going to. And what it was, was kind of my, my dream educational experience where... I got to be the educator that I've always wanted to be. It was, I said to them that it was, it's like getting permission to teach the way that I've always wanted to teach, which That's was awesome. through critical thinking and research analysis and questioning things. And But it wasn't, it wasn't content driven, curriculum driven. It was allowing the students to find their own way through history or through ELA or yeah. So you came in thinking you were going to get this curriculum to do an entrepreneurship class, and then you ended up 
designing in the workshop a pilot for your humanities course. I did. We, we did the business model. But with, I could see that becoming like a problem solution framework framework for looking how my students could look at situations in history or current events. Yeah, and because when you got there and you started seeing what this was and you decided, oh, wow, this is, I, I want to use this in my humanities course, you started thinking very differently about the start to your humanities course this year. And can you describe a little how you set up what these students of yours just went through? And this is the first month of school in eighth grade in your humanities course. And how many girls in your class? I have 31 girls. 31 girls. So tell us a little bit about your pilot. So I absolutely dissected all of my curriculum. I made all these maps. I did all these things, and I still couldn't wrap my head around how do I get them to care about history. And I didn't want them just to do history or turn something in in history. I wanted them to make connections between what's happened in the past and what's happening today. So my student teacher and I, Ms. Ellis, we found 40 of the most important events, kind of what we thought were the most important events of the 21st century. So everything from the minimum wage gap to the Pulse nightclub shooting to the transgender military ban. And we found pictures. We just started out with pictures. And we set up the library with pictures all around the room and just a placard that described what the event was. Just Paul's nightclub shooting. That was it. So the girls would have to go around and, and they, they examined everything. They took notes on what they saw. And they could use their phones to do research. And then they had to pick one event. And the next day we did a problem pitch. I was so not sure how this would work. I was like, this yeah. is going to be a disaster. Scary. Yeah. They're going to not do it, first of all. I will have yeah. girls rebel because they don't want to speak. And what happened was every single person had a pitch prepared. For the next day, a 60-second pitch to explain why this event is the most important event in the 21st century. And they did their own research overnight. Like, this is, this is the first week of school. They're doing this big, huge thing. And... Um, what are some of the examples of the, what the girls came in and pitched the next day? Well, like the Charlottesville attack, the clash at Charlottesville, they did a ton of research. They, it was the research that impressed me the most because if I, would have, if I would have said, you have to research this and given them this whole list of questions that they had to answer, I gave them no direction. So what they came in with were stories of people who were involved in Charlottesville or... Um, how the minimum wage actually affects a single mother or things that I just, I didn't think about the girls listening. So the audience were active listeners. They had to rank the pitches. So they ranked up to, they had to pick the top eight um, because we have a big class and the top eight pitches um, became our actual research project topics. Mm -hmm. And man, they were a very diverse group of topics. Um, Yeah. And there are contemporary issues these girls wanted to solve or address somehow. Yes. And they, everybody got their first or second choice of the groups that they wanted to work on. And so Black Lives Matter, racial profiling, um, Trump presidency. So they were researching. Um, they had to figure out the, what the true problem is. So we had to go through this process of how do you refine a problem? It's huge. It was huge. Yeah. It challenged me so much as a teacher. It's it's not just, it's very different for me just to give curriculum. I know how to do that. Yes. But for me to get you to think about how to get a question down to a solvable problem and you're 14 years old, because they would say, like, how can we possibly solve this problem? Right. You can. There's a way for you to do it. And when they would, so we worked through a six-question kind of distilling process, and they would get their question down to something that they felt was solvable. And, and they went directions that I didn't even think they would go in at all. So women's rights, at first they wanted to look at domestic violence and how domestic violence had influenced women and their decisions. And what they ended up with was how women should have STEM, be trained in STEM projects because, and how they should uh, stand up for themselves in the workplace and know what the laws are. It was a totally different direction. This was the team 
yes, that presented the wage gap between yes. men and women. So yes. this is a great story because what you described to me the other day after I watched them and some of the other teams, and I was so impressed with these 14-year-olds who are presenting about the wage gap between men and women uh, and how to solve it, that what you're describing is really interesting to think about, that they started with having chosen uh, domestic violence uh, and and as they, what you said to me was that as they did their research, they realized, number one, they probably couldn't solve that problem in a month. And number two, that a lot of the root causes for domestic violence have to do with a woman not feeling empowered and not knowing how to self-advocate. And so they then changed or refined the problem they were working on, and that's how they ended up coming up with uh, the problem of the wage gap between men and women and a solution, I thought that was quite extraordinary. I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah, but they did through their research. They They went in a place I would have never gone. It was far better than anything I could have ever given them. Yeah, so then all these teams, you now uh, get them, and you're right, it's really hard to get them Mm -hmm. to refine their problems so that there's something they can grab hold of and get their arms around. And then what? So after they refined their problem and they started coming up with a viable solution, it was looking at the past of the problem. So they had to take the problem that they came up with, so wage gap could be an example, and they had to trace it back through its roots. And that seems like a simple thing, but to look at the timeline of an actual historical event or an idea or an issue in this country is pretty big. So like my girls who looked at Black Lives Matter, taking that back through time, like they took it back to slavery and then they looked at how we've handled issues with uh, racial inequality in this country since then. So it wasn't, but it was more refined than just a timeline. They actually could look at the, the nuances that happened at each step and how each step built on to So we got to the place where we are now. Which is so interesting. So most of the students uh, are African-American themselves. Yes. And these 14-year-olds are looking at a really, in a kind of sophisticated adult way, at cause and effect. Yes. Historically. Yeah, perspective. So my big ELA standard that I wanted to, to touch on was perspective and And that's also part of historical thinking in social studies. So when they were looking, like, for racial profiling or, oh, the Trump presidency was really rich, I thought they would get into that and just be mad. Right. And what ended up happening was they came up with this, they figured out that it's, and a lot of the groups figured out that it's not about how one group feels. It's about the other groups that are on the outside of that and the perspectives that they have. So instead of they went into it thinking they were going to look at why people voted for Trump and what they figured out was it was looking. So they said in our own community, in the black community, we look at it this way and that we need to change some of our biases, look at our stereotypes. So they created their solution was this whole thing on bias. They called it bias, B-I-A-S. And it it was knowing, um, getting rid of stereotypes understanding, like looking at all your information, knowing what you're talking about before you just start talking about it. Interesting. It's very sophisticated thinking for an adult. Let alone a 14-year-old. They had had an insight that most adults don't, and that's don't just believe something because somebody said it should be like that, that you should get to know the person and understand. And actually, every team in its own way kind of came back to that same solution in some way that there's another perspective and that you need to understand somebody else's if i would have come at them and said hey you need to walk in somebody else's shoes or done some of those it's meaningless yeah would not have made any difference but they they had this problem they were passionate about that they'd chosen they wanted to come up with something creative and effective to solve it and so they had to do a bunch of research to learn They did. They had to understand the past of the problem so that they could work on the future of the problem. Fantastic. So as somebody who's trying to teach history 
in this four weeks, you didn't get to decide what parts of history they were going to. Yeah. And did they, did they learn history in a way that you think is, will stick and will grow? It's far more meaningful and impactful than anything I could have taught them. Far sure. more. And it, they could make connections to the news. They would come in and say, like, I saw this thing on the news. And it's like, so they keep, they're still building forward with the idea that they originally had. And none of them went in the direction that they thought they were going to initially. That's interesting. And so I saw half of them present, and I was really impressed. And I was, in, real, and I was impressed in, in every dimension. I was impressed with their presentations. I was impressed with how thoughtful they were. I was impressed with how each one of them connected it to its historical roots and context. Some interesting things. I learned things I didn't know. I don't know if you did. Yeah. And I was impressed with their solutions. They were really thoughtful. They were very thoughtful and, and very doable. That was the thing that was pretty cool. So you, you, are a risk-taking teacher, and you've been teaching for 20 years. How different has this been for you? You've only done it once, so you're, it's early, but how different was this for you? Well, it's different for me in every way possible. I mean, I've never been a by-the-book teacher. It's never, I mean, I've always created everything that I was doing, and I've never used a textbook. I've never been a teacher like that but it's like you say it's de-schooling but it's de-schooling me yeah. it's not de-schooling the kids it's de-schooling me after 20 years of teaching I there still is like a kind of a finite way of looking at teaching still like we will all get to point Z by this date and and that's how you, that's, you're so indoctrinated to think yes. like that. There's a rigidity of it where it's like, you know, I teach, I assess, I reteach, I reassess, and I figure out where we're going. And this is like, I pose a problem. And the problem takes, a, there, it's the intentionality of how I have to do this. It's very different. I still always spend a lot of time on my lessons like that. Oh, it's a lot of work still. But yeah. This is a different, it's, it's not coming up with the answers. It's coming up with the questions. And the question Absolutely. has to be a very different question than what I've asked in the past. Yeah, there's, speak. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot more why and how do you know and, and then just walking away and like leaving you with it. And they do not like that. They don't like it because so. it's not, it, they're so trained. Right. That the way school works is the teacher tells them what to do, they do it, yeah. and then the teacher gives the grade, and this is so different. Yeah, this breaks all the rules of traditional education, and it feels freeing. <clears throat> it feels like that permission to teach the way I've always wanted to teach. It feels scary because I don't have the answer. Like, there's not a, I don't make up an answer key. I've never been that teacher, but there's not like a, there's not like a right or wrong to this. Well, I, you can't control the I box, can't control right? control where they go with it. And even, I can definitely assess them through rubrics and different things, but it's like the rubric itself has to be kind of fluid depending on where we go. So I have an idea in my mind when I'm starting I'm also a very, I'm very tough on myself with who I am as a teacher. I've noticed that. <laughs> so, so there's always that part where I want to do it better. I won't, say, I won't say perfect, but I want to do it better. And I want it to be, and I think for me, it's been good to kind of know, I, I can't control the better. The better happens because of what, what they, they do. do. It's not about what I do. I, I mean, I can build all the parts around it that will give them support or questions or the pathways, the, pathways, the rubrics, mm -hmm. the things that will help them know here's where we want to go. But where they end up going is really not up to me. And isn't that kind of liberating for them? It's very liberating for them. This group of girls, there's uh, most of these girls have been craving this their whole educational career. Talk about that. What do you mean by that? 
they have been waiting for a teacher that would allow them the space to grow as learners. I, when I see the, I can think of one group in particular when we're doing the migration, I would just walk over, just do check-ins with them. They were so intent on where they were going. I was, I'm not going to say I was inconsequential, but they, they don't need the structure. They made their own structure. Like all the things that they did, it was very eye-opening to me. I had some groups who still, you know, craved the asking the questions and wanting a little guidance. But most of the girls, they just, they want the space. So what, what you're talking about to me is makes me smile every time I hear a teacher who's been teaching for years discover that almost as a surprise, right? And it's, it's because of the way the system of education, the way we set it up, we think that we have to force them in some way or trick them in some way, or we have to be the pressure that causes them to learn. And then we're so surprised when we give them meaningful work, that meaningful to them. We're so surprised that every one of them is interested. They're curious. They want to learn. And they will, if you set it up well, and you're there to scaffold the way you're talking about, they're going to go further and deeper than we can ever get them to go by muscling them through it. With Right? Yeah, it's funny because for years I've, I've talked to other teachers, like my student teachers, about carrot on a stick. Yeah. Teaching a smoke and mirror. It's like, you know, you have to behind the scenes manipulate things. But really, they, this has shown me, and it should show every educator, whenever we think, especially about this generation, that they don't care. They're tuned out. There's nothing that matters to them. Like, they they do. They, they care, care so a lot. passionately. They're just looking for a way to show that they care. And giving them, there's a lot of choice in my class, the way that it's been structured this year. But it's authentic choice. It's not choice that's manipulated choice or, you know, choose A, B, or C. It's It's been very, very open. And for them, that has been, that's made all the difference because they feel like they're in charge. Yeah. And yeah. and it that isn't, what's, what's hard for people to wrap their heads around is that they're having, working on something that's relevant and real that no one's solved yet. And they're deciding what that is does not mean it isn't rigorous. Those two things are completely separate things. And they're not even they're not even separate from the learning objectives. No, they're not. I can hit all my objectives and it's completely rigorous. The challenge is absolutely there in my class. Like my principal is very she wants she wants to see the result of something. Right. She's come into the room. My students know what the objectives are. Like they can tell you, and it's not they can say it like robotically, like we are working on. They know. They're like, well, right now the perspectives that we're doing is authentic. Okay. So I'm hitting all of my objectives. Um, content as content well as skills, standards. right? Everything is in there. It's just set up different, and it's not just project based learning. It's because I've done project-based learning. No, it's here. not. It's a very specific thing, isn't it? It's yeah. weird. It's it's like something beyond. It's right. And so what we have is, is a very specific methodology that basically allows the students that kind of spark and, and interest in learning. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking because we just did a thing on system of human migration where they had a current event. And I'm thinking, like, I had a, a student... She went in this totally different tangent of where I would have ever thought that she would go. But her research questions, it, was she going in the direction that would give her the best results? No. Was, was her thinking and the way that she was working through the process of it dead on? Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, so it's like, and she's one of my students that struggles with this the most. She's one of the ones who's like, give me the answer. I just want the answer. Tell me what to do. I don't. So, I don't want to have to think about it. I don't want to have to think about it. So to see her completely engrossed in it and ignoring her team and sharing with me, like, the amount of research that she did and the questionings and how she analyzed every little bit of this, 
it didn't matter to me so much that she went in a quote unquote wrong direction. What mattered to me was that she was engaged. She took a risk. Like she took a big risk. She went with something that she felt in her heart mattered and proved why people had moved out of this country and knew it inside and out. That's my goal. The girls, I thought it was really extraordinary to hear what they, after the presentations, you ask them some questions. Like, why did we do this? Yeah. And I thought they're, what, uh, what were some, do you think the girls are understanding why? Because this is the tricky zone, the de-schooling, where a lot of kids really are not comfortable <laughs> yet not. in this place. They're not, but they could really see that the way that we started out the year helped them to understand that history is not isolated. It is not something that just happens and happens one time. So they could really see that there's a connection between the past and present. They could, they liked the open-endedness of that they were in charge of their own learning. They mm -hmm. liked the empowerment and the ownership of it. Even the girls who were kind of freaked out by it <laughs> yeah. still liked that they were in charge of it. I think they liked having an authentic audience. I mean, I know that was something that they talked about, is having actual people come in and not just presenting to a class or having paper that they turn in as a one and done. And even though I'm seeing the, the last presentation where we didn't have an authentic audience, I could see the remnants come over from the last one where they're taking it more seriously. It matters to them more. So I'm definitely seeing they're making the connection of why we're doing this. So we're, we're about five weeks into school. We just had an interesting conversation earlier today. Yes. And what, what happened? I'm trying to figure out... Uh, over the weekend, I was trying to figure out how am I going to teach. My next standard is about exploration and colonization in the 15th and 16th century. And I have not, I've only taught social studies once in my entire career and I taught it very old school. Right. And so I wanted to, um, before this week, I had, we had done a current events project on the system of human migration because I don't want to teach it just as an explorers and colonization and chronologically, here's what happened. I wanted them to understand the system of human migration first. So they looked at maps of human migration currently. They chose a country. They did a week-long project to show how human migration works today. And that was good, and I got to this place where I got stuck. And it was the, so you asked the questions about what do you really want them to learn? Because I do get stuck on what I want to teach. Yeah, because your first answer to that question was throwing in front of me these content, all stories. the content. I want yes. them to learn this content and that content and this content. Yes, I don't know how to teach it. I don't know how to. And then you're like, what do you want them to learn? If they walked away with one thing that you want these 14 year old girls to learn you in two weeks, <laughs> a specific girl in my head, and like, what is the end goal? And it helped me so much because I know what I want them to learn. I want them to learn the system of human migration, why people move. That's and it. It's just as simple as that. And I was way overcomplicating it and trying to figure out what you were going to teach, teach. what content you were going to How teach I them. I get them to know all these things. In is, two weeks. <laughs> right. Which is hilarious because I just saw these real life examples of how I don't have to give them everything. They figure out, I pose the questions. They have shown me that they can figure out. But it is, it's, it's de-schooling me. It's, it is, because in two weeks, you can't teach them everything about human migration. I can't. You can't. <laughs> and even if you had them for every day for two weeks and they didn't have to sleep or eat, and you didn't have to sleep or eat, and you could talk for 24 hours a day for two weeks, you still couldn't do it. And we also know, because we have tons of proof and evidence, that they don't retain what you, that kind of being taught doesn't stick anyway. There'll be a lot of hot air wasted. Yeah. So you turned all weekend and you came in today with all this content. I said, choose a girl. You chose one in your class. And I said, if in two weeks she could come out of that two weeks, 
having learned one thing, what would it be? And you said it really well. Why people move, and I won't, yeah. And, and so then when we use that as your starting point, it kind of freed you up to construct something very different. Yeah. Yeah, so now they are going to look at the refugee crisis authentically. Like, what's happening? Columbus does have a lot of refugees. They will be able to authentically figure out a solution to a crisis that's happening right now. Right. This is a relevant thing, and because... I mean, I have a lot of girls whose families are immigrants. This is, it's not just something that's um, theoretical over there, right? It is something that's happening here and to our girls. And you pointed out that we have a very vibrant Somali community. So we have some, not just past European colonization uh, examples that they can look at. I don't know what examples they'll look at. Because they'll decide, and they'll, they'll decide. come up with some solution to making Columbus a better place to live if you come here mm-hmm. as an immigrant. And in the course of it, as an expert teacher, you're going to be able to push them with your questions right. to understand the historical context for, for this, why right. these people moved here, whoever they choose, and also to look at other examples in history. Yes. And what is your hope in two weeks that they'll come out with? I think that, honestly, from looking at what migration studies look like in college, they really will have the same background knowledge as a college student who studies the sociology of human migration. I mean, it's not the way that this shifted and the project that it's shifting into is something that they will really care about and that they have people in their houses that are rich sources of information of how you come to a new country and understand something. And looking at, like, that's an authentic way to look through the lens of history and why did people come over? Like, what was it like when Columbus came to, you know? Right. But it's not just like, hey, Columbus came and all this stuff happened. It's, was that a successful example of a migration? Was it not successful? Why was it? What can we learn from that? Right. Were they successful or not successful? Were there successful migrations in the past? So in two weeks, these 14-year-olds, instead of what you were coming in with, which was your lots and lots and lots of research <laughs> around the content you were going to throw at them, they're out of these two weeks. Each and every individual student is going to have done a different their own personal exploration journey, following what is most compelling and interesting to them, making their own discoveries, and coming out of it with that nuanced, more sophisticated understanding that, whoa, the reasons people move are many and they're complicated and they look, they're all different kinds of things. And how great is that? Well, if I were an employer in the future or a college doing admissions and I had kids who could critically think, who could analyze things, who can work in teams, these are so much better than regurgitating some historical facts or regurgitating the fact that, you know, this happened on this date. When people look at this kind of education, which I think is more rigorous actually than traditional school, and they ask, yeah, but, well, that's great that they're engaged, but what about learning history, and what about learning critical thinking, and what about learning writing, uh, and those academics? They are still doing everything that you just said. There's there's way more critical thinking, I can say that for sure, compared to what I've done in the past. I love being a writing teacher, and so that part will never go away, but I can get them to write so much deeper, and they actually care about what they're writing about. Versus it's just an assignment. Right. And the curriculum, I'm hitting all the parts of the curriculum that I need to hit. That's awesome. I mean, there's no part of what I'm doing that is leaving anything behind. It's so nice to have parents come into open house and that they, the parents see the challenge. They see what their kids are working on at home. They are supportive of it. Your principal walks in and she's supportive of it. You have kids who are complaining because your class is challenging, so you know... (laughs) There's That's a, a good sign. Right. Yeah. It's all, it's, 
there's no part of what I'm doing right now that I go home at the end of the day and question and say, and I really wish I would have done that better. I am learning to let go of my perfectionism with education in that class because it's, it is free flowing and it's a fluid class. There's not. Because it's all about the individuals in the room. It's not about me. About about me. That's right. <laughs> yes, and I, you know what? I'm going to end there, and I'm so proud of you. And this is a lot of fun. Thank I'm you. having it's fun amazing. with you. This is great. If you want to hear more podcasts like this or learn about the Corda Method, visit our website at wildfire-education.org.